Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from AntiWar.com. This is Anti-War News for Monday, December 9th, 2024. All right, so the big news from the weekend was the overthrow of Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria, the former president of Syria. Reports say now that he's in Moscow. Nobody expected anything like this to happen so quickly. HTS launched its offensive less than two weeks ago, and on Saturday night into Sunday, they took Damascus. And al-Jalani, their leader, the leader of this al-Qaeda-linked group, who was former, formerly, officially the leader of Al-Qaeda in Syria. He was in Damascus on Sunday and declared victory. We'll get into that, but the first story here is about the U.S. reaction to this regime change, this overthrow of Assad by these Al-Qaeda-linked groups. Uh, Biden celebrates, this is the first story, Biden celebrates the ouster of Syria's Assad. So President Biden on Sunday celebrated the overthrow of the government of former Syrian President Bashar al-Assad by al-Qaeda-linked militants, calling it a fundamental act of justice. Biden said Assad's allies, Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah, could not defend Syria thanks to U.S. support for Israel and Ukraine. So he's giving himself a lot of credit here for this overthrow. He said, quote, The upshot of all of this is for the first time ever, neither Russia nor Iran nor Hezbollah could defend this abhorrent regime in Syria. And this is a direct result of the blows that Ukraine and Israel have delivered upon their own self-defense with unflagging support of the United States, end quote. Biden also listed ways that the U.S. had pressured the Assad government over the years, including through crippling economic sanctions and the U.S. occupation of eastern Syria. He said, quote, over the past four years, my administration had pursued a clear and principled policy towards Syria. First, we made clear from the start sanctions on Assad would remain in place unless he engaged seriously in a political process to end the civil war. Second, we maintained a military presence in Syria, our counter ISIS, to counter the support of local partners as well on the ground, their partners, never ceding an inch of territory, end quote. So a little bit of that didn't really make sense, but I I did transcribe what Biden said. Uh, But he's talking about the military occupation. And it's interesting. He says, never ceding an inch of territory. That sounds like he's referring to the fact that they're occupying Syria and keeping the, the, the land out of the hands of the government. They claim it's, a, uh, it's about ISIS, this, this occupation, but clearly it, is about, it was about putting the pressure on Assad, keeping Iran out of those areas, uh, you know, because this is what Israel wants. Um, so the third form of support that Biden listed was supporting Israel's, quote, freedom of action against Iranian networks in Syria and against actors aligned with Iran, end quote. So that means the U.S. supporting Israeli airstrikes in Syria. And for years, Israel bombed Syria with impunity. um, And those airstrikes significantly increased after October 7th. And then they increased even more in recent months. Israeli airstrikes leading up to this HD offensive were very, very heavy. So Biden said that the U.S. would maintain its military presence in eastern Syria and that the U.S. had launched airstrikes against ISIS targets in the country on Sunday. So U.S. Central Command later announced, sounds like the U.S. did a real heavy bombing. They said that the U.S. launched dozens of strikes against 75 ISIS targets in Syria using multiple aircraft including B-52 heavy bombers. General Michael Carrilla, the head of U.S. CENTCOM, said in a press release that, uh, said in a press release on the strikes that, quote, all organizations in Syria should know that we will hold them accountable if they partner with or support ISIS in any way, end quote. Um, but the Al-Qaeda guys, they're, they're all right, I guess. And so we'll see. Uh, so the U.S. launched these airstrikes on Sunday and announced them claiming that they had just ISIS targets. We'll see if anything becomes clearer about those strikes tomorrow. So it seems very, very heavy. 
So Biden said that the overthrow of Assad presented an opportunity for a new Syrian government, which he vowed to support. The president acknowledged that, quote, some of the rebel groups that took down Assad have their own grim record of terrorism and human rights abuses, end quote. So he says some of the groups that participated, but it's HTS led the offensive. Jelani is the leader of this um, takeover. And, uh, you know, I mentioned some of the background here. We've been talking about this a lot. Hayat Tahrir al-Sham HTS was formed in 2017 by merging al-Qaeda's Syrian affiliate, the al-Nusra Front, with other Islamist groups. And the al-Nusra Front rebranded in 2016. They changed their name, I believe, Javat. I forget exactly what, what that name was. But, you know, I wrote... or. Uh, I wrote in one of these articles that, you know, Jelani and, and the El Nisra Front, they um, publicly cut ties or they publicly split with Al Qaeda in 2016. And Scott Horton pointed out to me that that was kind of overstating it. And then I went back to look at what they actually, what Jelani and HTS, or at the time the El Nisra Front actually said. They said that they were cutting, you know, cutting ties with Al Qaeda and thanked thanked all the people at al-qaeda for understanding why they had to do it and then there was a statement from a a guy who was said to be the deputy to al-zawahiri who was the leader of al-qaeda at the time saying oh you know we support this move we directed them to do it because it's going to help the global you know jihad and essentially it was just all about rebranding so they can get support from the west and now here we are a few years later you know turkey has openly backed uh, HTS here, they used to, you know, do it more covertly, but, and they, they're getting all this support and this is, and Biden is basically saying, you know, that they're willing to work with these guys. Now, HTS is still a U.S. designated terrorist organization. The U.S. also has put a $10 million bounty on the head of Jelani, but there's talk already of, of changing that. So, uh, and, and Jelani recently sat down for an interview with CNN, basically saying he's more moderate. He was asked about his ISIS past. He was also at one point a deputy of al Baghdadi, the the ISIS leader, and you know, so he's an ISIS guy, Al Qaeda guy. But now he he was saying that was a phase in his life, and that you know he's he's you know there's a big risk here, of course, for the minorities in Syria, the Christians. Alawites, the Shia Muslims who have suffered under these extremist groups in Syria, and now they're in total control. Jelani's putting these things out saying, you know, it's a Syria for all Syrians, but, you know, he's, it's, we also know where this guy came from, and he's also saying other things indicating that it's not really going to be like that. Um, I know some people with family, Christian family in Damascus who have fled. People are trying to go to Lebanon. I mean, you imagine that situation, everything that's happening in Lebanon, and that's the only place where you could try to go at this point. Um, but anyway, so Biden seemed like he referenced what Al what Jelani's been saying lately. He said, quote, we've taken notes of statements by leaders of this revolution in recent days, and they're saying the right things now, but as they take on greater responsibility, we will assess not just their words, but their actions, end quote. So then the next story here, in Damascus, Jelani declares Mujahideen victory against Assad. So Abu Muhammad al-Jelani, leader of the Al-Qaeda offshoot, HTS, delivered a victory speech at the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, declaring the success of the Mujahideen against former Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, who has reportedly fled to Moscow. Jelani said, quote, today Syria is purified, thanks to God Almighty, thanks to God Almighty, then thanks to the heroic Mujahideen, end quote. And I know Mujahideen applies to a lot of these um, groups over the years, but that just always makes me think of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan in the 1980s that the U.S. supported against the Soviet Union, and then how did that all uh, play out? Um, so Jelani criticized Assad in his speech, and the Assad family ruled over Syria for more than 50 years. I mean, this is a big deal, what, what's happened here. Um, and Jelani criticized Iran, saying that Assad let the country become a haven for Iranian greed. Um, I get into some of just about the offensive here and the rebranding of al-Nusra. Um, so, you know, there's all these different factions, you know, even under HTS, there's all different kind of groups. You know, one that we talked about recently was the Turkestan Islamic Party. Those are the Uyghurs. They're one faction. 
Um, there's other factions under them. And then there's the, the Syrian National Army, which is the, they're all backed by Turkey. And then there's different, even different factions among them. And then you have the Kurds. So everybody's going to try to get a piece of the action here. So there, I think there is a chance of this falling into a really nasty civil war. Uh, but we'll see. Because, you know, it, I think it's clear Julani wants to be the guy. He wants to be the leader here. And he also said, you know, it's going to be an Islamic nation. And, you know, so it's, uh, you know, we'll see how it how it all plays out. But again, uh, just the, the concern for the minorities here who have historically suffered greatly under, you know, groups like HTS and leaders like Al Jalani in Syria. All right. So the next one here, armed groups have guaranteed security of Russian bases in Syria. So a big question is, how did this happen? Some are, you know, speculating that the Syrian army didn't want to fight. So they just retreated and that was that. Others are saying Russia kind of didn't give them the backing that they wanted. Russia or Iran or Hezbollah didn't want to fight for Syria. Uh, we don't really know exactly what happened, but Russia is, you know, basically saying that they're in contact with the opposition and that they have all these guarantees about their military bases that are in Syria. So a source in the Kremlin has told Russian media that militants who have overthrown Bashar al-Assad have guaranteed the security of Russian military bases in the country. A Kremlin source told TASS, quote, Russian officials are in touch with representatives of armed Syrian opposition whose leaders have guaranteed security of Russian military bases and diplomatic missions on the Syrian territory, end quote. Militants led by Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, again, I just mentioned what has happened in recent days there, the Kremlin source also told TASS that Assad has fled to Moscow for asylum. The source said, quote, Assad and his family have arrived in Moscow. Russia has granted asylum to them proceeding from humanitarian considerations, end quote. Earlier, the Russian foreign ministry confirmed that Assad had decided to flee Syria. There are these rumors that his plane crashed or that his plane was shot down. Um, but Russia saying, or the, these Russian sources at least, so far it is just, Russian sources speaking to Russian media saying that Assad is in Moscow. Um, but there are these rumors that his plane crashed. But what I think might have happened is it was like the tracker, transponder, whatever you call it on a plane that they t that went off. You know, they might have just turned that off because they were worried about being tracked or getting shot down. Um, so the, the Russian foreign ministry, again, this is what they said uh, in a statement, quote, following his talks with a number of participants in the armed conflict in the Syrian Arab Republic, Bashar al-Assad decided to step down as the Syrian president and leave the country, instructing the government to transfer power peacefully, end quote. Uh, all right, so the next one here, another person eager to take credit for Assad's overthrow is Netanyahu. Netanyahu takes credit for the overthrow of Assad. So Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Sunday celebrated the overthrow of Assad um, and confirmed that Israel has seized territory inside Syria, a buffer zone that separates the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights from the rest of Syria's territory. So Israel grabbed more territory from Syria. Netanyahu said in a visit to the Golan Heights, to that border region, quote, this is a historic day in the history of the Middle East. The Assad regime is a central link in Iran's axis of evil. The regime has fallen, end quote. Netanyahu credited Israel with setting up the process that led to the downfall of Assad. In the months leading up to the HTS offensive, Israel was waging a war against Hezbollah and ramped up airstrikes in Syria. Netanyahu said, quote, this is a direct result of the blows we have inflicted on Iran and Hezbollah, the main supporters of the Assad regime. This has created a chain reaction throughout the Middle East of all those who want to be free from this oppressive and tyrannical regime, end quote. So this is a map of the separation. The Israeli occupied Golan Heights are to the west of this buffer zone. And this is an area that was patrolled by UN peacekeepers. Um, so Netanyahu also said that he directed the IDF to capture this territory. And um, so this is, uh, there was reporting from the New York Times and elsewhere that Israeli troops had actually also entered Syrian territory beyond the buffer zone and took control of several locations. Um, and 
uh, Netanyahu said, quote, together with the defense minister and with full backing from the cabinet, I directed the IDF yesterday to take control of the buffer zone and the dominant positions near it. We will not allow any hostile force to establish itself on our border, end quote. So, of course, framing it as defensive, taking more territories defensive as a temporary uh, thing here. But look at Israel. They don't have a history of ending occupations. Um, so, uh, th- so there are signs that Israel has been planning to make a move like this before the Assad government collapsed. Recently, the Associated Press reported that Israel began construction along the buffer zone, citing satellite images. After the report, uh, the UN peacekeeping force there warned that Israel was committing severe violations of the deal with Syria that established the buffer zone, and that was in 1974. Um, And, you know, again, this is all about Israel here taking out uh, an Iranian ally in Syria Syria is a major hub for weapon shipments from Iran to Hezbollah. So Israel, of course, is very happy about this downfall of Assad. All right, so the next one here. uh, So there's, again, we're going to move away from the Syria stuff, but there's a lot to say, a lot to speculate about. It is a big, huge deal what's happened uh, over the weekend, and we'll see how it all plays out, what the uh, aftermath is like how all these different groups handle each other. All right, so Israel kills three civilians in southern Lebanon despite ceasefire. We're more uh, So this is from Jason Ditz. We're more than a week into the Israel-Lebanon ceasefire. Israel has continued carrying out airstrikes against Lebanon despite the ceasefire, and the number and intensity of the strikes appear to be escalating over the weekend. At least three civilians were killed on Sunday in Israeli atti- in, in an Israeli airstrike against the southern Lebanese town of Dibain. So Dibine is north of the town of Kiam, which has been a frequent target during the ceasefire. So early on Saturday, four people were killed. So a total of seven killed by Israeli strikes over the weekend. The total number of Lebanese that have been killed by Israel since the ceasefire started has risen to 23. So we're kind of back to where we were before Israel's big escalation with like daily Israeli strikes that kill a few people. And the difference here is that Hezbollah is not firing on northern Israel. As far as I know, all they've done is fire those two rockets toward Israeli positions, and and that was it. Uh, All right, the next one here. Oh, so this is actually about Israeli strikes in Syria. This article is from The Cradle. So also on Sunday, Israel took this territory, and they launched a bunch of airstrikes in Syria, saying that they're Israeli officials are saying that they're destroying weapons so they don't end up in the hands of hostile forces. This article is from the cradle about it. It says Israeli airstrikes hit the Maza district of Damascus and an airbase in Suwaida in southern Syria on December 8th. Um, And dozens of Israeli airstrikes hit the Maza military airport along with customs and intelligence buildings, the security square, scientific research facilities, and defense laboratories. Additionally, suspected Israeli warplanes bombed an airbase in southern Syria. So very heavy airstrikes in Syria. All right, so the next one here, Gaza, the daily slaughter continues. Israeli attacks kill 44 Palestinians in Gaza. So Gaza's health ministry said Sunday that Israeli attacks across the Gaza Strip killed 44 Palestinians and wounded 74 more over the previous 24-hour period. So the ministry only counts the dead and wounded Palestinians brought to hospitals and morgues. As I always mention, there's still a number of victims, they say, under the rubble and on the streets that cannot be reached. Israeli attacks on Sunday included Israeli artillery shelling of the Indonesian hospital in Beit Lahia, northern Gaza. Uh, You see this picture here is the aftermath. You see it's a hospital room that was bombed. And uh, so the Indonesian hospital has come under attack not quite as frequently as the Kamal Adwan Hospital, which is the other hospital in Beit, Beit Lahia. And this is the city where they're conducting the, the, this ethnic cleansing campaign. I believe there's only a few thousand Palestinian civilians left in the city. They're, they've, they're, they're demolishing all the houses, all the buildings, so they can't return. Um, and they've been attacking the Kamal Adwan Hospital more over the weekend. That was where in the last episode of this show, Uh, I went over the story where they killed a 16-year-old Palestinian boy in a wheelchair. That was right outside the Kamal Adwan Hospital. So the heavy strikes in the north continue. Also in Gaza City, there were strikes, which is also in the north. Um, And then there were strikes in central Gaza. At least five were killed. 
in an attack on a tent camp near Deir al-Bala, central Gaza, and another five were killed by Israeli strikes that hit a group of civilians north of the southern city of Rafah. All right, so the next one here, Israeli historian produces vast database of war crimes in Gaza. This article is from Middle East Eye. So an internationally recognized Israeli historian has concluded that his country is committing genocide in Gaza after compiling a vast methodical report documenting a litany of war crimes committed since Israel's invasion began last year following the Hamas-led attacks of October 7th. So Lee Mordecai, an associate professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, who has also held a fellowship at Princeton University in the U.S., has published a report titled Bearing Witness to the Israel-Gaza War, which in its English translation is 124 pages long and contains over 1,400 footnotes. So using eyewitness reports, video footage, articles, photograph, eyewitness evidence, and other investigatory material, much of it Recorded by Israeli soldiers, the historian has produced what Haaretz calls the most methodical and detailed documentation in Hebrew of the war crimes that Israel is perpetrating in Gaza. So this is Israeli media reporting on it. This is an Israeli professor and historian. Some of the most shocking incidents documented by Mordecai include a Palestinian woman with a child being shot while waving a white flag. So a woman with a white flag and a child get shot. Uh, starving girls being crushed to death while waiting for bread, a handcuffed 62-year-old Palestinian man getting run over by an Israeli tank, and an airstrike targeting people trying to help a wounded boy. I've seen a video like that. The database includes thousands of videos, photos, testimonies, reports, and investigations documenting the atrocities Israeli forces are committing in Gaza, where over 44,500 Palestinians have been killed during the war. Uh, He also includes a section on the media, propaganda, and the war, noting that the current war has been enabled and facilitated by massive media efforts to shape discourse in Israel as well as in the West, in countries such as the United States, Canada, the UK, and Germany corpses killings and sunsets so there's a lot of brutal stuff in this report i'll just read one more example here um so he refers to a a video clip showing a large dog eating the corpse of a palestinian and an israeli soldier is filming it and says oh look the terrorist is gone the terrorist is gone he's eating the terrorist or whatever and then a few seconds later he pans away from the corpse and the scene around him and says what a gorgeous sunset there is here. So again, you see kind of the depravity in the Israeli soldiers here. And he also details the killing of children, um, Palestinians again being shot with white flags, just really, really uh, horrific stuff. All right, so the next one here, Trump calls for an immediate ceasefire in Ukraine. So this article is from Kyle Anzalone. President-elect Donald Trump demanded an immediate ceasefire and negotiations to begin in Ukraine. Trump made the remarks on Truth Social shortly after meeting with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Trump wrote on Sunday, quote, Likewise, Zelensky and Ukraine would like to make a deal and stop the madness. They have ridiculously lost 400,000 soldiers and many more civilians. There should be an immediate ceasefire and negotiations should begin. Too many lives are being so needlessly wasted, too many families destroyed, and if it keeps going, it can turn into something much bigger and far worse. He added, I know Vladimir well. This is his time to act. China can help. The world is watching, end quote. So on the campaign trail, Trump told the American people that he would bring the war in Ukraine to an end within 24 hours of taking office. Without laying out a plan, since getting elected, he has appointed Russia Hawks to some of his staff. So Kyle gets into his staff. Um, you know, I'm uh, trying to be optimistic on Ukraine. You know, at least maybe one good thing can happen that this horrific war could end. Um, so, but we'll see what happens. All right, the next one here: the U.S. announces a nearly one billion dollar weapons package for Ukraine. So on Saturday, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin announced that the U.S. would be providing Ukraine with a new weapons package worth nearly $1 billion. The package, which is worth $988 million, is being provided through the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, 
which allows the U.S. to purchase weapons for Ukraine. According to the Pentagon, the weapons package includes ammunition for the HIMARS rocket systems, drones, and other equipment components to maintain artillery systems, tanks, and armored vehicles. Austin announced a new military aid in remarks at the Reagan National Defense Forum, where he called on the incoming administration to build on what the Biden administration has done. Um, And I just get into how the Biden administration has been working to ship as many weapons as they can before Trump comes in, signing off on all these escalations, the long range strikes, the anti-personnel mines, pressuring Ukraine to draft 18 year olds to be sent into the the fighting, even though there's no shot at a military victory. They just want to keep feeding. They just want more young Ukrainians to die. They just want to continue this thing no matter what, no matter who has to suffer. All right, so the next one here, Romania annuls election results over TikTok videos. So this article is from Zero Hedge, um, and it's about what happened in Romania. The uh, The Constitutional Court just canceled the, the presidential elections. The first round happened, and the front runner um, was uh oh man I, I meant to look up how to pronounce his name and i did before but i forget but his name is colin george esu he is considered far right you know that's what the media calls him i guess relative in romanian politics but he's critical of nato and i mean that's really i think the the problem that the rest of the eu has with him i'm sure um but essentially uh the constitutional re- court made a decision even as voting was still underway. Um, so there's apparently second rounds and, and they annulled the first round where he was in the lead. The constitutional court said, quote, the electoral process for the election of the president of Romania will be resumed in its entirety with the government required to set a new date for the election of the president of Romania, as well as a new calendar program for carrying out the necessary actions End quote. So they annulled the whole process, and the, and the justification for it was that um, the uh, there's a lot of TikTok videos, and they're claiming that it was a Russian campaign on TikTok. He, you know, he there was the camp, there was basically campaign videos for this guy on TikTok, and they're claiming it was a Russian plot. So they've canceled the election over TikTok videos. Um, And, uh, you know, his, his, his win in the first round was, you know, considered a shock outcome. And then all the, his political opponents claimed Russian interference, which we just hear about all the time. Uh, all right. So the next one here, the last story, South Korean president Yoon to resign. So this article's again from Kyle at the Libertarian Institute, the party of South Korean President Yoon Suk Yul says he will step aside after his failed attempt to invoke martial law last week. People Power Party leader Han Dong Hoon explained that Yoon would resign sometime soon and would cease all official business immediately. He said, quote, through the orderly early resignation of the president, we will minimize the confusion to South Korea and its people stably resolve the political situation and recover liberal democracy. Even before his resignation, the president will not be involved in state affairs, including diplomacy, end quote. Um, So Han said, along with Prime Minister Han Duk Su, he would help govern Seoul through the transition of power. During a joint presser, the two leaders stressed the importance of South Korea maintaining a strong military relationship with the U.S. and Japan. Um, So Yoon's downfall started Tuesday night when he declared martial law. South Korean parliament voted against the order, and then he backed back down. Oh, so they did have the impeachment vote to remove from uh, to remove him, but the ruling party, his party, did not participate in the vote. So the impeachment vote failed, but they're saying he's done. His party, I guess they want to control the change in power. So his party's saying that, you know, he's, he's stepping down and, and he's not even, um, you know, involved in his duties anymore. So Yoon is done after his little martial law stunt. And hopefully this results in a cooling of tensions on the Korean Peninsula. All right, so that is it for the news for today. Please go check out our viewpoints. One from James Carden, Islamist takeover of Syria proves Tulsi Gabbard was right. One from Kyle Anzalone, Washington celebrates Al-Qaeda's victory in Syria. 
One from Ted Snyder, one day Ukrainians might hate America. One from Michael Chapman, just say no to NATO expansion. And one from Ben Armbruster, free speech crises loom with crackdown on Israel criticism. Go check all of that out. Go check out our blog. A few interviews I did, one with a guy named Eric Sammons over at Crisis Magazine. It's a great Catholic magazine that I like. I did their show. Um, I also did Scott's show. It's got it's a little out of date. I did Scott Horton's show last Thursday. We talked about Syria a lot. So it's a little out of date with everything that's happened, but um, you can find that at Scott's, uh, his podcast feed. Um, oh, we also posted Tucker Carlson interviewing Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, which was interesting to watch. Um, kind of made me feel better about the risk of escalation. Lavrov seemed pretty, pretty chill about everything. <laughs> Um, definitely worth, uh, checking that out. Uh, but that is everything for me. I hope everyone had a good weekend. Um, you could always support the show, like subscribe, comment. Uh, I will be back tomorrow with some more news. Thanks for listening.